are not where we want them to be. We're not pro uh, we may feel that we're not providing for our family or for our needs like we should. Or maybe it's uh, maybe you're a student right now, high school or college, and your grades aren't where they need to be. Or how about uh, maybe in your career, you're not doing what maybe you had uh, planned your life to be, and you're not doing the things that uh, you wanted to do, or, or the things that, or how they should be done. So, and even today, how about uh, this COVID-19 virus? You know, what is that doing to, to us, and how do we feel about it, and what's, what kind of fear is that installing in us? How about spiritually? Do you feel do you feel spiritually inadequate? You know, maybe in um, your reading and your quiet times, or or maybe not being able to to cite verses or pray like other people do. You know, what about that? Does that does that affect you emotionally? Well, you're not alone in this. You know, in one way or another. Uh, inadequacies affect each and every one of us. What I want to do is I want to share three ways or three feelings that could contribute to our inadequacy. Now these aren't the only three, but these are three that I came up with. And the first one is criticism. You know, maybe you were criticized as a, a young man or young woman that uh, you would never amount to anything that you were no good at doing this or that you know maybe that came from a teacher maybe that came from a family member maybe that came from your co-workers that you would never amount to anything and number two is what I call unrealistic compliments in other words people always telling you that you're the best that you're amazing at everything that there's nothing you can't do. And basically what they're doing is they're, they're setting you up for failure. Because there's always an area that we may not be qualified to do. And the third one, and this is probably the, the, uh, the worst of them all, is comparisons. Comparing our lives to everyone around us. Have you ever noticed that when and if you compare yourself to somebody that is usually somebody you know that that uh, falls short of what you can do. So comparing our lives to everyone around us, you know, what we have, what we do, you know, and instead of thanking God for what he's given us, we fall into Satan's trap. And this is one of the Satan's traps, that if, that if he is successful, and getting us to compare our lives to people around us, then he wins. And we don't want to fall into this trap of comparisons. What I've done today is I've, I've titled today's devotional called Fears of Inadequacy. And what we're going to do is we're going to be in the book of Judges, chapter 6, and we're going to look at, the, at a story about a, na about a man named Gideon. Now, people know about Gideon, those that, are, that read the Bible, and that, you know, the main story about him is how him and 300 men defeated a much larger and uh, stronger army. But we're going to talk about something else about Gideon. What did it take for him to get there? What did it take for Gideon to be able to be used by God? What did he have to do? Because if you if you look at Gideon and the start of the story of Gideon, there was no way for him to succeed. He had no abilities, he had no courage, he had nothing that anybody in this world could use. In fact, he was just a normal man, a normal person, just like you and I. But this is a time in Gideon's life where he had to overcome some inadequacies for God to be able to use him. So as we look through this, as we read through this story, uh, we're going to go, we're going to look at three principles 
that can help us overcome inadequacies. So let's pick up in chapter 6, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. So a couple of things here, Midian. Midian means strife or contention. And right now they were a very strong nation. In fact, if you want to know where Midian came from, you can go back to Genesis uh, chapter 25, and you can see who this person Midian was and who the Midianites were. But it says here that they were delivered for seven years, and there's an implication there about this number seven. Verse 4, it talks about how they were ravished. It says here in verse 4, And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth, till thou come unto Gaza, and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. So they were ravished for seven years. They destroyed their, their fruit. Basically, they left them with nothing. Nothing to eat, nothing to harvest. In verse 6, it says, And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So after seven years of having their crops taken and destroyed, Israel calls out for help. And what I found it interesting in these seven years is, you know, the number seven is a, is a number of completion. So God had, had them overtaken by Midian for seven years. And that's what's amazing about how God works. Seven years for them to finally realize that they needed God back in their lives to help them. So what does God do? Well, God does what he does every single time that he wants to accomplish his purpose. He takes a single person, a man or a woman, someone just like you and like me, and he calls them to do something great, a dark horse, if you will. And I want to give you a definition of a dark horse. A dark horse is a little known person, unlikely to succeed, who ultimately accomplishes great things. And when you think of dark horses, I think of the, the movie uh, Hoosiers. If you guys ever saw that movie, or Rocky, how about the movie Rudy? And the greatest one I think that people talk about is Miracle, the 1980 hockey team. See, all these were people that were simple people, had no way to succeed, and yet God was able to use them. He was able to use them in a mighty way. So God takes a normal person, just like you, just like me, and he calls them to do something great. So listen here to how God calls Gideon. It's a simple man, a normal man, to overcome some of his inadequacies. So let's drop down to verse 11. Verse 11 says, And there came an angel of the Lord, and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abizrite, and his son Gideon thrust wheat by the winepress, to hide it from the Midianites. So, a few things going on here. Threshing wheat. So if you've ever threshed wheat, uh, uh, normally what you do is after you cut the wheat, you go up to a high place and you throw the wheat up in the air and you use the wind to separate the wheat from the chaff. And I do this whenever I, I'm cleaning my uh, chicos or cleaning my beans. It's the same process. You throw it up in the air and you let the wind separate the, the bad stuff from the good. But what's unusual here, if you'll notice, is where is Gideon doing this? In a wine press. Basically, he's in a hole in the ground behind an oak tree. So why is he threshing wheat in a wine press? 
Well, he's hiding from the Midianites, basically because he's afraid of strife and contention. He's afraid of the Midianites, of what they can do if they find him, of what they can take away from him. So listen to how God starts to work in his life. Let's look at verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. So the angel of the Lord, we know who that is, right? He appeared to Gideon, who was hiding in a winepress. And he tells him, I am with you, you mighty man of valor. Mm -hmm. A mighty man of valor means man of strength and might. But when I first read this, that's not what I saw. I didn't see a mighty man of valor. I saw a man hiding, afraid of what could happen if the Midianites found him. In fact, do you think that Gideon felt like a mighty man of valor at this point? And how about you? Do you feel like a mighty warrior that God could use? The thing is, it doesn't matter what you or I think or see, at this moment in Gideon's life, God speaks to him and says, I see a mighty man of valor. So fears of inadequacy. What and how did Gideon overcome this? How, how can we overcome these fears of inadequacy that we might have in us? Well, let's turn to principle number one. I talked about having some principles. Principle number one says, God sees in you so much more than you see in yourself. See, a lot of times all we see in ourselves is our inadequacies. And maybe that's due to our past failures. Maybe that's due to our uh, careers that didn't go the way we thought it would. You know, whatever the, the, the reason is, um, those inadequacies are there. But God sees a mighty warrior. And God sees in you much more than you see in yourself. Think about these people that God used. David. Remember King David? David was just a shepherd boy. But God saw a man after his own heart. What about Rahab? Rahab was a prostitute in the Old Testament. But God saw a mighty woman, even to the point where she is in the genealogy of Jesus. And what about Peter, the Apostle Peter? Failure after failure, you know, things that he said and did. But what did God see? How many churches did Peter plant? See, God saw a church planter. You want to know what we see, what Larry and, and, uh, and John see? They see how God is working through you in this church. The worship team, I mean, look how that has changed in just the past few weeks. How about the children's ministry? You know, that couldn't get done unless you guys were there to do it. The youth, you know, what about the service that you guys provide here? I mean, that's, that is God working through you. And why is that? Why is that, that that you are doing these things? God saw more in you than you saw in yourself. But how many of you are doubting what God sees in you? How many doubt what God sees in them? Well, you're not alone. You're not alone in that. Gideon doubted. Here's Gideon's response to God calling him a man of valor, a mighty man of valor. So th let's look at verse 13. And it says here, And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So, listen to what Gideon is saying. 
he's giving a list of excuses. Basically, he's giving a list of, ex of excuses, saying, Lord, you don't, you don't need me. I can't do this. Says, you can do it. Look what you've already done. Get somebody else, or you do it, Lord. Does that sound familiar? You know, disagreeing with what God sees in you and, and disagreeing with what he wants you to do? Well, here's God's response to Gideon. Verse 14 says, And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go and go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Had not I sent thee? The Lord looked upon him. And that's an interesting word, looked. And this word look means to turn. It means to face, to gaze. It's like when a child is ignoring you when you're talking to him. It's like God saying to Gideon, Look at me, Gideon. Listen. Pay attention. No excuses. Just go. And that's another interesting word, go. And this word go in verse 14 means to move. It means to get up. It means to go forward. It means do something. It also says, in this might of yours, it says, go in what I've already given you, in the power, in the strength, in the might. And that's what might means. It means, uh, it means power, it means strength, but not your power, not your strength, but in what I have given you is what the Lord is telling you. So I believe what, what he's saying here is, is you know, that we need to die to our sense of inadequacy and let, let God work through us. So you might not think that you're a leader. You might not think that you're a mighty warrior. But God uses people behind the scenes much more than, you know, the people that he uses behind the pulpit. Volunteers are very important. You know, the, the pastor by himself can't take care of everything. He can't do, he can't be teaching the youth, he can't be teaching the, the children's ministry. So God uses you more than what you realize. Teachers, greeters, uh, ministry leaders, the staff, I mean, he uses you people in a mighty way. Mm -hmm. See, see God, God even uses our past failures. You know, don't let your past failures stop you. God uses these to your benefit. You know, just like Gideon, stop telling God what you don't have and start going, start using what God has already given you. Let's look at um, 2 Peter 1.3. Second Peter 1.3 Is according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So we can there you go, sorry about that. See, we can read that verse and we still want to push back. You know, I can't do it. You know, I don't speak Spanish. I can't go to Cuba. You know, I, I, I don't have the strength to be able to go help somebody build a house. See, and, you know, that you're not alone in that. Look at what Gideon says in verse 15. It says, And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. See, he's telling the Lord, he's telling the Lord, I can't do this. Look, I'm the weakest, and I'm the least in my family. We're the we're a poor family, and spiritually, I just don't have what it takes. Or, you know, but if you want to defeat the Midianites in your life, look at verse 16. Verse 16 is a very powerful verse, and it, it was for Gideon, because from there, 
basically he never turned back so verse 16 says and the Lord said unto him surely I will be with thee and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man mm. and that takes us to point number three to principle number three God working through you is less about you than you think So in Philippians uh, 2.13, let me go to Philippians 2.13. It says in Philippians 2.13, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Mm. So if you if you caught that, it says God in you to fulfill his good, his good pleasure. And that's God working through you. It's nothing, it's not about you, it's about what God has done. And I believe, if, uh, if you'll forgive me, I, I missed principle number two. Principle number two is the second thing we need to understand. Principle number two is God has already given you more than you can imagine. He's given you the gifts. He's given you the abilities. I mean, in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, the things that we need there. Romans, uh, you can also check out Romans uh, chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verses 8 through 10. Ephesians 4.11, 1 Peter 4.11. And these are all the gifts and abilities that he has given us, given us to prepare us, to equip us for those many nights that are in our lives. But the problem there is this. You know, if we continue just to sit in the sidelines and hiding in fear, then no one is ever going to see how God can use us. So this word go also means, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very, uh, that's what I like about the Hebrew language. It's rich in meaning. And this word go means to die, mm. to live, to, uh, it's a manner of life. So I believe what he's saying there is that we need to die to our sense of inadequacy and let God work through us. See? And that's, you know, again, you might not think that you're a leader. You might not think that you're a mighty warrior. See, but God can use you behind the scenes. And we can't let our past failures, those things that, that haunt us, we can't let those stop us from doing what God has called us to do. So let's look at what Gideon says. Uh, we looked at what we looked at what he said in verse 15. That because he's the least in the family, because his family is poor, and, and he has nothing to offer that God couldn't use him. Well, again, verse 16 is for you, and 16 is for him, and 16 is for me. Verse 16. And again, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and read. Verse 16. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And again, that takes us to principle number three. God working through you is less about you than you think. That means depending far less on us far less on me and more on God. So this, this story, in this story, God called Gideon to deliver Israel from the Midianites. He chose 300 men armed with nothing but pitchers, lamps, and trumpets mm -hmm. 
to defeat a much larger and equipped enemy. In Judges um, 7, 2, it says, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest is Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand has saved me. So I think this was God's strategy so, so that when they got the victory, only God could get the glory. You don't let strife, don't let contention, pride, don't let fear stop you from doing God's work. You know, we're living in a time now of, of doubt and, and fear. You know, we don't know what's going to happen with this COVID-19. We don't know what's going to happen with, with all the restrictions that may come upon us. But are you going to hide in your house, in your wine press? Or will you place your faith in Christ and take the gospel wherever it's needed? John 10, 10. I'm going to go ahead and read that. John 10, 10 says, and this is one of John's favorite verses. <laughs> says, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. See, many people who have, who have received eternal life are defeated by their, their own flesh and therefore they're unable to eat the fruit of, of abundant life God intended for salvation to provide. Midians or stripes, ultimate target is the harvest. So they're here to starve you spiritually. First Corinthians one twenty seven one twenty seven to twenty nine says But God hath, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen yea and things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence So this is not about you. This is not about me. It's all about God. It doesn't matter what you need or what you want. This is about what God can do through you, using you. See, every time I'm here, and I'm sure Larry and, and John feel this way, leading a Bible story or uh, a Bible teaching or, or a devotional, see, we want you to hear what God says to us not what we want what we want to say. See, he has the power to change you. Each and every one of you. I don't. John doesn't. Larry doesn't. See, he's the one that is worthy. We're not worthy. So how do we overcome? We need to understand that God sees in you more than you see in yourself. Amen. Number two, we need to understand that He's given you more than you could ever imagine. He's given you all the tools that you need. And number three, we need to understand that it depends less on you when God is working through you. So I want to end with this. I want to end with this thought, with this question for you. What are you not attempting that God is calling you to do? What is God prompting you in your heart? Well, read through the book of, of Judges, chapter 6, and see how Gideon overcame. And this is how you can overcome. Let's pray. Father, again, we come before you, and I, I thank you for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank you for using me today, and I pray that your words were spoken today. 
I pray for all those that are out there that may be uh, struggling through what's going on in, in this country with this uh, virus that Lord you take away whatever fears they might have you take away whatever inadequacies they feel they have and you use them Lord God to go next door mm. to talk to their neighbors to talk to their co-workers to talk to their family use them in a mighty way Lord God that they can uh, present you to them so I thank you again for this opportunity I thank you for this place I thank you so much Lord God for what you're doing and especially for what you're going to do mm -hmm. in Jesus name Amen thank you